The Ahsoka trailer is finally here, and in it, we got to see many cameos from the heroes whose story never got to be finished, with the crew of the Ghost finally returning. And yet again, they're facing off against one of the greatest threats that the galaxy has ever seen, and the Mandoverse has been building up to, and that is, of course, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Greetings, once again, Acolytes of the Galaxy, and welcome back to the Archives. The name Thrawn sends chills down the spine of anyone familiar with the Star Wars EU, and in recent years, this terrifying admiral has taken his rightful place in canon. Thrawn is someone who makes the Empire scary again. Our idea of intimidating Imperial leaders usually comes in the form of the two reigning Sith Lords that occupy the higher facets of the Empire, but Thrawn is different. Other leaders in the chain of command usually come in the form of Grand Moffs and governors like Tarkin. Tage, and Krennic, leaders who normally sit around a table and bicker with one another. However, Thrawn is the man who is hands-on, the one that makes the Imperial Navy something that is not only formidable, but nearly indomitable. But with Thrawn's return now at hand thanks to the Ahsoka series, what can we expect from this powerful warlord? What does Thrawn actually want? And can Legends continuity once again be our navigator? Or are we flying blind? Today, students of the Force and Acolytes of the Galaxy, we will be exploring what makes Grand Admiral Thrawn so dangerous that he can compete with the might of Sith. There is something very helpful that is happening with the Thrawn story playing out before us, and that is Timothy Zahn. The writer of all of the Thrawn Legends novels has been brought back for his canon iteration, and has written all of the canon books as well. Because of this, Thrawn is just as purely dangerous in canon as he was in Legends. But what this also means is that the canon timeline of Thrawn's story has actually been closely followed, and much of the Legends iteration of Thrawn now belongs to canon as well. Thrawn begins his journey as a man in the Chiss Ascendancy, loyal to his people, and ready to do whatever is necessary to ensure their protection and survival. However, he is somewhat coldly extremist in his views, and what he is willing to do in order to protect the people that he loves. Thrawn is willing to do things that normal Chiss will not do for moral reasons. Part of the Chiss's creed is a strict aversion to attacking without it being absolutely necessary. They would much rather be reactive than provoke a war, no matter how dangerous the building threat is. However, it was Thrawn who challenged this idea, and decided to move forward with a preemptive strike against their enemies. In canon, this was a warring group known as the Grisk Hemorrhagy, but in Legends, this was the Yuzhong Vong, which the Chiss referred to as the Far Outsiders. Thrawn was a controversial figure among his race, as he defied the rules of not attacking without being provoked first. This won Thrawn many victories in naval combat, but earned him a poor reputation among his people, despite all of the wins. This didn't seem to bother Thrawn so much though, as he was more concerned about the safety of his people than abiding by the rules that would lead to their extinction. After all, his homeworld of Kasala was not a part of the Republic, as it was in the unknown regions of space. And if the Chiss didn't defend themselves properly, there was no no one else that was going to come to their aid. But for Thrawn, everything would change during a fateful meeting with Chancellor Palpatine during the Clone Wars, a meeting in which both agreed on the coming threat that was the Yuzhong Vong. However, the Vong weren't entirely aware of the Galactic Republic just yet, and both Thrawn and Palpatine wanted to keep it that way for as long as possible, or at least until the Galactic Empire was built and they could mount a proper military defense. However, the biggest wrench in their plans was the outbound flight a project organized by the Republic to send a team of researchers and Jedi to investigate what lay beyond the unknown regions of space. What this would have done was to make the Vong aware of their presence, and perhaps provoke them into attacking the Republic and known space much sooner. Teaming up with the Chancellor, Thrawn thwarted the outbound flight, ensuring its total destruction. But this was the final straw for the Chiss Ascendancy, who had had enough of Thrawn's continued preemptive strikes, and they exiled him to a distant world on the fringes of Chiss society. He would later be discovered by the Galactic Empire sometime after their rise, and brought before Darth Sidious directly. The Emperor remembered Thrawn's brilliance in the destruction of outbound flight, and he was instated into the Imperial Navy. It was here where Thrawn understood his mission, and grew in Imperial command, knowing that he would be the single best possible defense against the Vong. This was his main goal in Legends, to protect the wider galaxy from the extra-galactic invaders that were coming. As the clock was ticking at their imminent arrival, Thrawn was then sent back into the Unknown Regions in order to build up the naval defense, but while he was gone, something very important happened. The Empire was all but destroyed in the Battle of Endor, 
Enraged by the Empire's destruction at the hands of the Rebellion, Thrawn patiently waited and built up his fleet of Imperial Remnants before returning to attack the New Republic, doing so in the year 8 ABY, exactly five years after the Battle of Endor. You see, it was his idea that the Empire was the best possible answer to the growing threat of the Vong. He believed that it was the only force that could protect the galaxy from utter annihilation. So when the New Republic suddenly showed up and toppled the Empire, this ruined everything and caused Thrawn to fear for the worst. In response, he went on a warpath and cut through the New Republic, securing victory after victory and nearly bringing the entire governing system to its knees. In canon, it's only slightly different. Rather than meet Palpatine during the Clone Wars, the young Thrawn would actually meet Anakin Skywalker, and the two of them together would stop the Grisk hemorrhagy and prevent disaster from reaching the Chiss people. However, the Chiss leaders would be compromised by telepathic invaders who corrupted the minds of the Chiss High Command and caused a civil war of Thrawn's people. This would be what caused Thrawn to get exiled and then be found by the Empire once again. Thrawn was then brought before Sidious, and he offered his aid to the Empire, knowing that it would be of help to his people. Sidious was impressed with his genius and his loyalty, and had him put in the Imperial Naval Academy, instantly granting him the rank of Lieutenant. Thrawn would climb the chain of command until being awarded the rank of Grand Admiral by Palpatine himself. Thrawn would work closely with Darth Vader on a few occasions, and just by observing how the Sith Lord conducted himself in battle, he would deduce his identity as Anakin Skywalker. However, Thrawn would wisely keep this knowledge to himself, and as a result, Vader worked very well with him as they saw eye to eye on many things. Many things, but not all things. We know the canon story of Thrawn from here. He would go on to take on the challenge of crushing the rebel insurgency on Lothal, which would put him against the Ghost crew and Ezra Bridger. But now that he is back, which is unsurprising considering how familiar Thrawn should be with unknown space, considering the fact that he grew up there. Using Legends as a template, it seems Thrawn has returned to not only avenge the Empire, but possibly to act on the Emperor's contingency plan, resulting in the creation of the First Order. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the birth of the First Order all starts here with Grand Admiral Thrawn, and we could learn how they grew to power in the sequel trilogy. Thrawn himself is an absolute powerhouse of a being, not in physical strength or force power, though we've seen him demonstrate above human fighting capabilities. His true danger is in his massive intellect. His intellect is an absolute trump card in the Star Wars lore, not a super weapon or a massive amount of force power, but superior strategy. Thrawn is the war tactician like Kenobi is the master of Sarisu. Thrawn wields his fleet how Sidious wields force lightning by himself. Thrawn was able to take down an entire squadron of stormtroopers in order to secure his escape from exile with nothing but rocks, rope, traps, and stolen gear. With only one ship, his flagship by the name of the Chimera, he was able to outmaneuver and destroy a New Republic defense force and escape an entire fleet. Just by observing the art of a particular planet or culture, he could decipher exactly how they thought and how their minds and emotions functioned. Using this knowledge, he could craft his battle plans to perfect suit the opponent he was facing, and in some cases, he never even had to fire a single shot by simply the position of his fleet and putting it in the right way in order to transmit a message to the system that would then surrender. In this way, Thrawn secured victory hand over fist against the New Republic in Legends. In Legends, this was all aided by his Dark Jedi puppet in Jorah Sabayoth. And now, there is not only a single Dark Jedi in canon, but two. Perhaps a master and an apprentice, and maybe Thrawn will be using them for his grand plan, like how he used Joris in Legends. The bottom line is though, Grand Admiral Thrawn is likely the most dangerous man alive in the galaxy right now, and we are about to see his plan unfold. Grand Admiral Thrawn continues to stand as one of the most formidable and fearsome threats in the post-imperial era of the galaxy, and not in terms of his physical strength, but rather his massive intellect. He is among the most intelligent tacticians that the galaxy has to offer, and has routinely used these skills to further his own agenda of complete galactic domination. This has led many to wonder, however, if the Chiss Admiral has been able to deduce one of the most closely guarded secrets that the Empire had within their ranks. Did Thrawn ever come to find out that Vader and the fabled war hero Anakin Skywalker were one in the same? 
And if so, what were his thoughts on this? What did Thrawn think of Vader in general? And what kind of relationship did the two of them have? Greetings again, Acolytes of the Galaxy, and welcome back to the Archives. Throughout the Thrawn trilogy, we come to learn more about his backstory and rise through the ranks to Imperial Admiral. One of the major things that we learn about is what Thrawn was up to during the Clone Wars. Whilst living in the unknown regions amongst the rest of his people, Thrawn underwent a covert mission into the known galaxy, seeking potential allies and more information regarding the rest of the galaxy's inhabitants. The Chiss were a removed people in fact, a highly intelligent removed people. It was in his journeys to the known universe that Thrawn crossed paths with the famed Jedi General, Anakin Skywalker. Their meeting comes from the novel The Thrawn Ascendancy, Chaos Rising, and although their alliance was a brief one, it soon became incredibly strong. At this point in the war, Anakin had been in the process of tracking down his secret wife and esteemed Republic Senator Padme Amidala, only to find that her starship had been found abandoned on the world of Batuu. Desperate, Anakin Skywalker made a deal with Thrawn and his immediate commander. Anakin agreed to trade intelligence regarding the war and the state of the Republic for Thrawn's services, specifically in finding his wife, whose prolonged absence made both Anakin and the Republic quite worrisome. Together, they confronted a band of smugglers who had found Padme's ship, and later, a group of assailants in the nearby town, working together to stave off the assault and figure out what happened to the senator. Throughout the course of the expedition, Anakin told Thrawn about the Separatist movement, the scourge of the war, and everything that had happened throughout the last several years. And Thrawn used this to create a profile on the Republic itself with Anakin's help. With the intel by Skywalker, Thrawn was able to assess the Republic's potential as either an ally or a threat to the Chiss people and was able to make an informed decision upon returning to the Unknown Regions. As they continued to discuss the war, they tracked Padme to the world of Makiv, a mining planet in the Cortosis Mine, which was under Separatist control. And together, they were able to save Padme. Upon his return to Coruscant following the battle, Skywalker spoke highly of the Chiss strategist, ultimately being the first to put him on Palpatine's radar as a brilliant tactician and the esteem given to Thrawn by Anakin persuaded Palpatine to look further into this mysterious warrior. Likewise, Thrawn praised Anakin as a gifted combatant and warrior, as well as a battlefield commander, admiring his composure and demeanor. While the Alliance never transpired as a result of the Republic's stagnant bureaucracy, Thrawn was able to smuggle artifacts back to his people. Artifacts including a Separatist shield generator which helped him to reinforce his fleet. When the Empire rose in the ashes of the Republic, Thrawn joined their ranks and helped Palpatine by commanding his own level of Imperial regime, putting his tactical skills to good use and in the process, encountering someone calling themselves Lord Vader. Shockingly, it didn't take Thrawn long to deduce the true nature of Vader's identity, and what tipped him off the most was not actually any of the battlefield strategy or the nature in which Vader conducted his operations but rather, it is what took place whenever Vader was questioned about Skywalker. Anytime Anakin's name, history, or rank were brought up within the Empire's discussions, Thrawn became attuned to Vader's response, and eventually was able to put two and two together. After realizing this, he quickly caught upon many similarities between Vader and Anakin, and it was now far easier for Thrawn to understand why the two operated so similarly in regards to their battlefield conduct. Thrawn was also smart enough, however, to never mention the fact that he knew aloud, as he understood the consequences which would take place if he ever voiced this clearly. However, Vader too caught on that Thrawn knew his identity, but their relationship went further. Thrawn was not only special in that he knew Vader's true history, but also because he was one of the very few Imperials who did not fear the Dark Lord. In return, Vader's commitment and loyalty to the Empire earned Thrawn's admiration, and they were able to work together on several occasions following the dawn of the Empire. Once again, the two were able to work closely with one another, with Thrawn's strategic mind formulating plans and operations for Vader with his sheer military brutality. While their alliance was largely unrefuted, there were a few blemishes on their history together, primarily centering around Thrawn's failure to apprehend the Ghost crew on several distinct times. The Ghost crew had proven themselves to be one of the most pervasive thorns in the Admiral's side, and Vader quickly grew impatient with his failures, but these shortcomings were redeemed by the rest of his accolades as an officer. When Thrawn set into motion his new TIE Defender project, Vader was one of the most vocal supporters, and his sway within the Empire allowed Thrawn's pet project to be greenlit. 
This led to the development of the TIE Defender Elite, a new class of defenders which surpassed the previous generation in nearly every single way. Unfortunately though, this was later sabotaged by Ezra Bridger and Sabine Wren from the Ghost Crew. There was however one major disagreement between Thrawn and Vader. However, Thrawn was never stupid enough to voice this directly to the Dark Lord. Thrawn's major complaint with Vader is exactly how he treated his men. Vader had no quabbles with absolutely decimating every officer under his command if they failed him or questioned him a single time. Thrawn, on the other hand, viewed this as a waste of resources. In fact, one of the greatest attributes of Grand Admiral is his ability to put away his own ego. He believed that the Death Star was an ego-fueled project as well, which ultimately was correct. Thrawn believed that he could improve the morale of a soldier by offering forgiveness, on one occasion even promoting a man even though he failed because of the simple fact that he tried. A comparison between the two men could go as follows. Grand Admiral Thrawn had a grand picture, and he would do absolutely anything necessary to win the war with the Rebellion. Vader, on the other hand, would do anything to win a specific battle, no matter if it cost him later in the larger war. And this was the major difference between the two of them as commanders and generals. And now, I would like to end with one of my favorite quotes from the Thrawn novels. For a long moment, they stood together in silence. Vader thought about his secret, about Thrawn's loyalty, about the Emperor's continued need for him, perhaps the entire Empire's need for him. Anakin Skywalker is dead, he said. Thrawn lowered his head. I know. Vader nodded slowly. I know, so I have heard, so I was informed. But I know. We will not speak of him again, Vader said. You will not speak of him again. I understand, my lord, Thrawn said but I will always honor his legacy. And that, my friends, is the detailed and complex relationship between Thrawn and Vader, two of the most powerful men in Imperial history. The Death Star Project was to be the crown jewel of Darth Sidious's empire, and for nearly two decades, the empire pulled in massive amounts of resources in order to build the massive battle station, a battle station capable of destroying entire worlds. The Death Star was designed to be the ultimate symbol of rule for the empire, and was designed to specifically dispel any rebel activity from arising. The goal of Sidious, Tarkin, and Krennic were to create a battle station of such a magnitude that no one would ever dare raise arms against it. With the Empire allotting massive resources, as well as slave labor from worlds such as Kashyyyk, when word reached Darth Sidious that the Death Star had been destroyed, the Empire was dealt a massive blow. Not only was their battle station no more, but the Empire was now proven to be fallible. Before this ever occurred, however, there were two extremely high-ranking Imperial officers who held Palpatine's ear who were staunchly against the Death Star. Individuals that may shock you, in that being Darth Vader and Grand Admiral Thrawn. Let's discuss Thrawn first. What's important about this is that in Star Wars canon, Thrawn was not actually led into the secret of the creation of the Death Star. As an alien, Palpatine respected Thrawn, but he did not allow him all of the secrets of the Empire instantly. However, the genius mind that was Grand Admiral Thrawn was able to deduce that the Empire was building a massive battle station that the galaxy had never seen before. Being able to deduce this thanks to the massive amounts of slave labor, as well as hyperdrive engines and fuel being imported by the Empire daily. Thrawn would even voice his concerns about the Death Star to his subordinates, ones in which he ultimately trust, stating that he believed that creating one massive weapon was a mistake, and rather that the Empire should seek to expand rather than leave all of its eggs in one basket. Believing while it made the Empire exceptionally powerful, it also made for a massive target. Thrawn believed that the Empire needed to expand its reaches, not consolidate them. Instead, Thrawn was of the belief that they needed to produce more Star Destroyers as well as naval capital ships, essentially creating the largest fleet that the galaxy had ever seen. Just a few weeks following this, Thrawn was granted a private audience with the Emperor, and although he lacked the specifics of the Death Star, such as the size and true power of the weapon, he warned Sidious about allocating all of their resources into one location. Thrawn then proposed the idea of creating an even larger naval fleet to the Emperor. However, in response, Darth Sidious promised that once the Death Star was fully operational, that they would no longer need a fleet as large as the Empire currently had, that the Death Star would serve as the ultimate sign of Imperial rule. 
dismissing Thrawn's concerns about the battle station. In the end, Thrawn would be proven absolutely correct, and this can even be seen in The Rise of Skywalker, with Darth Sidious' change of plan. While it is true that the Star Destroyers in The Rise of Skywalker could also destroy planets, and Palpatine's plan is riddled with even more errors here that we won't get into, it is clear that by some extent, he took Thrawn's words to heart, instead opting to control a massive naval fleet rather than a single battle station even though the First Order would try that again. If Thrawn had gotten his way, however, the victory of Luke Skywalker in the trench run in A New Hope would not have meant nearly as much. The Rebels, even if they managed to destroy several capital ships, would still not make a dent in the Imperial Navy. Thrawn was absolutely right, and if the Emperor had embraced Thrawn in this moment, he would have destroyed the Rebellion swiftly. But that answers why Grand Admiral Thrawn was against the creation of the Death Star. But what about that of Lord Vader. Vader realized how powerful such a super weapon truly was, the greatest super weapon to his knowledge that the galaxy had ever seen. Vader's issue was not so much with the battle station itself, but rather with the men that operated it, and the idea that they did not deserve the power that they wielded so freely. He believed that power like that must be earned and understood. Darth Vader went through massive lengths to achieve such a power in the dark side of the Force. He had sacrificed his wife, he had sacrificed his legs and his arms, his family, his code, anybody that he ever cared about. And these men that professed to want to rule the galaxy had sacrificed nothing. This had been given to them in the form of a massive machine, a killing machine. Vader had suffered, been molded, and these men were not worthy. Vader simply saw the Death Star as a means for lesser beings to grovel for power. Grovel for power in an empire that they did not own, and their arrogance and enthusiasm over such a battle station and such power infuriated the Dark Lord to no end. So despite all of this, why was Darth Sidious so enthusiastic about the Death Star and pushed for its completion as soon as possible? Well, contrary to the likes of Darth Vader, Darth Sidious had been taught a different sentiment. Very early on in his career as a Sith Lord, Darth Sidious had learned that the machinations of the Force could in some way rebel. When Plagueis and Sidious attempted to spread the dark side across the galaxy and cloud the vision of the Jedi, they also allowed the midichlorians to rebel against them and create the chosen one that was prophesied to destroy them. His own master and Darth Plagueis had experienced this, and this was a lesson that Sidious would not soon forget. Therefore, Sidious pushed for the creation of a battle station of such a size to combat against anything that the Force could throw at him. He did not know from which corner of the galaxy a light side threat may arise, but he knew that one was coming, and instead of strictly falling back on his ability of the Force, Darth Sidious needed something more. He needed something drastic, a battle station with the capabilities to destroy entire worlds. While it's true that the Death Star was meant to be a message, it was also meant to be a contingency plan. With the creation of the Death Star, Sidious believed that any rebellion that sprouted up in the depths of the galaxy could be snuffed out instantaneously, and he would finally have ultimate dominion over the galaxy. The Death Star was to represent the very fist of the Emperor. With a weapon as penultimate as the Death Star, Darth Sidious could do what he always wanted, to sit back in his throne and learn the secrets of the dark side, perhaps even perfect the dark side itself. The Death Star was enough to rule the galaxy as an iron fist. Palpatine already had the galaxy, and the Death Star was his security. This is where there is the major difference between Thrawn and Sidious. Sidious cared for himself ultimately in the end. He cared for his time and where his efforts were being devoted. Sidious had a passion for the dark side and for knowledge. Thrawn's goals, on the other hand, were to preserve the Empire at all costs. He put the Empire above himself and above his own ego. And that is why Grand Admiral Thrawn was correct. And that is why, if the Emperor had simply heeded the warnings of Thrawn, in time, he could have sat back and learned all the secrets that the Dark Side could ever offer him. At ease, officers, and welcome back to the Imperial Academy. Grand Admiral Thrawn was the finest war tactician that ever graced the ranks of the Empire. In both legends and canon, his presence indicated a certain defeat in almost every scenario thinkable against his enemies. In the Heir to the Empire Legend series, his dealings against the New Republic almost brought them to their knees after 
only having been around for around four years. In canon, it took the Force itself to intercept in order to get Thrawn out of the picture, before the beginning of the Galactic Civil War. Thrawn's absence during the time of the Rebellion is definitely felt, as the Empire suffers multiple defeats and had a very difficult time nailing down the Rebel Alliance during the entirety of the war. There were many shortcomings and problematic decisions made by the Imperial High Command that all could have been avoided had Thrawn been there. Furthermore, we would go as far as to say that the Alliance would have stood absolutely zero chance at all had Thrawn been involved in the Civil War. I myself even highly doubt that Darth Vader would have had to be as involved as he was if Thrawn was there to take care of the Rebels. Our top researchers have uncovered some unique data files that give us a peek into Thrawn's strategies, and we have acquired a few notes on how the esteemed Grand Admiral would have dealt with the Rebels. In this video, we will be talking about such strategies, and proving that it might have been unlikely that the Rebellion ever made it as far as destroying the Death Star and Zero ABY, had Thrawn been around. Before we begin though, we have noticed that a few ensigns have not yet enrolled into our data briefing program, so if you like what we do here on the channel and want to continue getting updates on all of our videos, be sure to blast that subscribe button. Now, be sure to inspect your uniforms, because we are now commencing. When the Mon Calamari joined the Rebel Alliance, they brought with them a fleet of retrofitted transport freighters to act as battle cruisers. This gave the Alliance a distinct edge, as they were then able to act as a formal military now that they had a proper navy. Admiral Akbar was the leader of said navy, and worked closely with Mon Mothma and the rest of the Alliance leaders to deal fatal blows against the Empire in a quick hit-and-run raid which is a process that they then continued. One of the few times the Rebel Alliance entered a full head-to-head -head naval confrontation with the Empire was at the Battle of Endor, when the Mon Calamari cruisers engaged the Imperial fleet at the second Death Star. Other than this though, it was a very rare occurrence that the Alliance ever engaged the Imperial fleet unless they knew of certain victory. There were only so many of these Mon Calamari cruisers, and they couldn't risk losing hardly one of them. Of course, we do know of the fact that the Rebels also managed to find at least a couple of old Separatist dreadnoughts that they managed to get staffed. The primary source of their navy though was from Admiral Akbar. This is why we don't see a lot of traditional naval warfare in the Galactic Civil War like we do during the Clone Wars. The reason we bring this up is because because we believe that this would have been the exact thing that Grand Admiral Thrawn would have exploited. In almost every other naval engagement, Thrawn immediately had the upper hand due to how he would analyze his enemy and pick out their tactics and weaknesses almost on the spot. In some cases, he would be able to tell simply by the formation that they had their ships in. He did this by studying the specific art of the culture that he was fighting against. Thrawn had a distinct interest in art, and among all of his other skills, he was particularly adept at learning almost everything he needed to know about a people group just by their culture's art pieces. By doing this, Thrawn managed to pinpoint their kinds of strategies, and any shortcomings by analyzing the mind of the culture's artists, as then he would know the minds of their warriors. As we've learned, Imperial Intelligence was fully aware that the Mon Calamari were responsible for providing the rebellion Ships. So Thrawn would very likely begin at once to study the art of the Mon Calamari people, as well as some data logs of previous engagements with Admiral Akbar himself. By doing this, Thrawn would definitely figure out the exact weaknesses that plagued most of Akbar's strategies. For one, he would know that Akbar was itching for a good head-to-head -head fight in which he would be able to decimate some Imperials. However, Akbar has to play it safe and use evasive tactics to stay ahead of the Empire so that they would not lose any of their valuable ships. Thrawn would possibly play into this exact thing, and either bait Akbar or trap them in a head-in-hand -head engagement which he would most certainly lose. By forcing the Alliance fleet into a direct confrontation, Thrawn immediately snatches any and every advantage that they have. While Thrawn definitely has them in the cruiser category, what about the starfighter category? We plan on making a video talking about the Imperial Navy's greatest weakness, and the fact that it was their starfighter department because they insisted on cutting costs on both the TIE fighter as well as with their pilots. If Thrawn were allowed full control, this would not be a problem. For one, Thrawn would make sure to design the pilot training program himself, and be sure to hand-select pilots that had seen more action, since that was an advantage that the Rebels had over the Imperials. The X-Wing pilots just tended to last longer, so what they lacked in formal training they made up for an experience while fighting with the rookie TIE pilots. Having none of this, Thrawn would make sure to take care of this problem as well, as well as the issue with the TIE starfighters in general. Thrawn had once designed and submitted the perfect starfighter, the TIE Defender. 
The Defender literally countered all of the traditional problems of the TIE Fighter, as it had deflector shields and a hyperdrive, while still retaining the advantage of being fast and maneuverable. Darth Vader himself was actually impressed with the Defender prototypes, and they had his approval. The only problem was, it costed a lot more than the standard TIE Fighter did, so it was thrown by the wayside. The reason the TIE Defender matters so much is because of the next point we're about to make. Thrawn did actually have a plan in place that would have utterly destroyed the Rebels, and we know about it. Thrawn's ultimate strategy in crushing the Rebellion was simply to use the Empire's superior resources to beat them at their very own game. The Rebels' greatest asset and their bread and butter was their ability to move around quickly. They had several bases that they could switch between on remote systems, as they could get up and move at a moment's notice, constantly evading the Empire at every single turn. This was the main problem that the Empire had in both A New Hope as well as The Empire Strikes Back. They had a hard time locating the Rebels' hidden bases. Second, any time they would find it, the Rebels were two steps ahead and always managed to get away because they traveled extremely light. Our esteemed Grand Admiral would not have such issues because of his simple solution create a small, elite Imperial strike team that can keep pace with the Rebels. We have seen time and time again that the Rebellion can't hold their ground for very long against a direct Imperial assault. The Battle of Hoth was less of a battle and more of a massacre in some regards. Thrawn knew the Rebellion's tactics well, and had suggested that an elite task force be formed to use the Empire's superior training, equipment, and resources to act as hunter-killers. This would have made the Galactic Civil War much more like a Terminator story. This elite squad would have extended into the Starfighter Corps as well, which is why we had brought up the TIE Defender. Regular TIE Fighters could engage X-Wings in a dogfight just fine, but X-Wings had the advantage of a hyperdrive to make their attack and then quickly escape from the TIEs. However, the TIE Defender now also had a hyperdrive and could just follow them right on the heels of the Rebels. Back in the early days of the Rebellion, X-Wings were all only equipped with one set of Proton Torpedoes due to the lack of resources that they had. So whenever they spent their torpedoes, most pilots just went ahead and made the jump out to light speed. Mission accomplished. However, if the Empire were to follow them and re-engage the X-Wings after that they had spent all of their resources, it would be over. These things just go to show that Grand Admiral Thrawn, had he been around, would have won the war effortlessly on behalf of the Empire and that the Imperial Navy especially wouldn't have stood a chance. The New Republic barely stood a chance even with all of their newfound resources. In Ahsoka, we get a look at the brand new state of the galaxy following the reign of the Empire, with the show hammering home all the inefficiencies and fault in the New Republic, all the bureaucracy, and all of the failure. From the ineptitude on dealing with real emerging threats, and their obvious favoritism towards helping allied systems, to their bafflingly naive approach to dealing with former Imperials, the New Republic has continued to shock us in just how badly they are mismanaging their own government. This is clearly setting up the difficulties they are going to face when handling Thrawn and the Imperial Remnants. But this isn't a canon-exclusive problem. In Legends continuity, the New Republic was woefully unprepared for Thrawn's return, and their own idiocracy and political Political infighting allowed Thrawn to gain so much ground in his campaign that he managed to even lay siege to the capital world of Coruscant. In Legends, Thrawn would explain why he detested the New Republic so much, and he detailed exactly why the New Republic was a corrupt, failing system. It was the goal of Thrawn's campaign to not only take over and conquer the galaxy, but to expose the New Republic for its impotency and show the citizens of the galaxy why the Empire was the ideal institution. And he was nearly successful in this. So what exactly was the New Republic's problems according to Thrawn? Well, today, Acolytes, we'll have a look and see that these same problems will likely echo into Star Wars canon, and the state of the galaxy could turn in favor of the Grand Admiral. The most important thing about how Thrawn viewed the New Republic comes down to what he actually called them. In Heir to the Empire, we learn that Thrawn refuses to call them by the name the New Republic, but instead still decides to refer to them as a rebellion. In fact, he didn't allow anyone on his ship to call them anything other than the rebellion, and he would become uncharacteristically angry if they were. It was because the Grand Admiral refused to dignify these rebels' new institution by actually addressing them as any form of organized government, because organized is something that they certainly were not. Thrawn insisted that the New Republic earned the right to be called that, and up until this point, they were still the Rebellion. This was because Thrawn stated at one point that it is actually because their government was born from a rebellion that they are unable to have a stable political system. 
when all of their leaders are those who began their careers by resisting a larger power. They aren't completely sure how to run it as an institution, where they are the ones with the power. There's nothing to blame for the state of the galaxy other than themselves, and they are woefully unprepared for the responsibility that comes with running the Republic and the galaxy at large. Because leading a rebellion and leading a bureaucracy are two completely different things. Their whole organization is held together and motivated by a common enemy, and when that enemy is destroyed, there is nothing left to unite them. And this is when the selfish corruption begins. Grand Admiral Thrawn saw right through into the weaknesses of the New Republic from the very beginning. The moment we are introduced to Thrawn and heir to the Empire, he is exploiting the shortcomings of his opponent by using art and past precedents to his advantage. He would continue to do this not only militaristically, but also ideologically. He would go around to many of the New Republic's vital worlds and exploit their inability to act by taking them over with ease. The preliminary strikes of Thrawn's campaign focused on testing the defenses and resolve of the New Republic, while at the same time gaining vital information and building up his at the time small fleet. The New Republic was far too slow to respond to these threats, not wishing to start another war and being far too cautious. But Thrawn decided to bring the war to their doorstep and began this by making a public display of their ineptitude. On one very important event, Thrawn managed to destroy the resolve of a system without even needing to break their planetary shield. Thrawn intercepted their call for help to Coruscant, and after conquering the planet, the New Republic could do nothing. He did this repeatedly to many systems, each time with a different objective, but all with the same goal of proving to the galaxy that the New Republic could not protect them. This had the intended effect, as many systems then began to willingly join Thrawn out of fear, and some with the hopes that he would be able to protect them from any oncoming threat. This was only the first problem with the New Republic. They were soft, and they were far too slow. They wanted to resolve things without the use of force, and didn't like the idea of mobilizing their military too quickly, fearing another war. As a result, they were sluggish to respond to attacks. This allowed Thrawn to gain a lot of ground on them quite easily. A major part of this was because of the political infighting that plagued the New Republic Senate Committee. We got to see a little bit of this in the third episode of Ahsoka. None of the representatives are on the same page. They're either cowardly or self-serving, and they're too conservative or unwilling to allocate resources if necessary and it's unfortunate that people like this are in the Senate because they inhibit the power of the more progressive individuals such as Admiral Akbar, who makes decisive actions. One such senator in Legends goes by the name of Fay Laya, a Bothan senator who constantly undermined the New Republic military, as well as Akbar in an effort to gain more power within the New Republic. He would constantly cause problems with people like Leia and Mon Mothma while playing political games with them. He was the beginning of a new wave of political corruption like the Old Republic had seen, and it now appears as if the senator from Ahsoka will take up that role, who is inhibiting Hera from being able to use the New Republic fleet against Thrawn. Because of this, Thrawn will use this to gain more ground in the New Republic. Effectively, they are staggered, whereas Thrawn is an unstoppable force who is constantly evolving. And it all comes down to the fact that he knows without a shadow of a doubt that all those who serve him are loyal. Loyalty matters a great deal to Thrawn, which is why he's sure to treat his men with respect and kindness. Unlike many of other Imperial officers, Thrawn isn't out for ego, megalomania, or personal glory. The reason that he makes sure that he keeps himself on top is because he knows that there are things that must be done, and that he is the only one that can do them. In a quote, Thrawn explains why there should only be one on top, and why he believes democracy fails, believing in an empire and its emperor. While other voices can advise, there must be one voice to decide, to rule, to be obeyed. Thrawn is always a stickler for ensuring that his commands are the ones to be carried out, but he also rewards and appreciates input and ingenuity. He likes multiple perspectives because it gives him a new way to think through any given situation, just like multiple people analyzing a piece of art. This completely separates him from Sidious and Vader, who believe themselves to be far above everybody else that they are practically infallible, believing their rule to be the rule, surrounded by stupid worms. Despite the fact that Thrawn has a more totalitarian ideology, he is not evil. Many have stated this before, 
but it is the general consensus that Thrawn is closer to lawful neutral in alignment than any other category. He has sworn his allegiance to the Empire, which is a totalitarian society, and he intends to make it the regime, since it is the best thing for the galaxy in his eyes. Thrawn at many points criticized the methods of Vader used on his many ships. He knew that ruling by fear alone would only get one so far. One needed to have their subordinates fear their authority, but also respect and understand it. He only punished those who refused to make the intelligent decision. If someone made a decision that was tactically sound, but it ultimately failed, Thrawn didn't punish them for their failure but encouraged them to continue to think outside of the box, while also adhering to the order that they were given. All of this was to create an environment of mutual respect, hard work, and an attitude of excellence. All of these made for an extremely strong crew of workers aboard his ship, and ultimately the foundations of a powerful empire of fanatical but intelligent loyalists. The thing about Thrawn is that none of this is for his own desire or power. The Grand Admiral treats power as a means to an end that end being an orderly and a thriving galaxy. He despises the New Republic because they cannot give the galaxy what it truly needs, that is stability. It cannot even protect them, and it is Thrawn's responsibility to prove that. It is his calling. It is not what he wants to do, but it is if he follows what he needs to do. We can see these kinds of impressive results from Thrawn's rule by analyzing the Empire of the Hand, Thrawn's shadow empire that was established in the Unknown Regions. We released a full holocron all about the Hand, but we will remind you what kind of society Thrawn created and the Hand created. Thrawn made sure the Hand treated enemies with respect, gathering much intelligence before engaging any threat, and emphasized tactical reasoning, and prioritized the safety of his soldiers. The Empire of the Hand also allowed non-human species within their ranks, and they did not rule by fear. This made all the systems ruled by the Empire of the Hand quite happy with their new overlords, introducing to them a new era of prosperity and peace. This in turn made the Hand stronger, as these systems were more willing to give more and serve them. In the end, this completely cut out all the corruption, evil, and megalomania that existed in Sidious's empire, that exist in the New Republic. The Unknown Regions was protected from pirates and marauders due to the network of systems led by the Hand far more protected than the New Republic. This, of course, is a stark contrast from the kind of tight-fisted regime that Palpatine had, squeezing his underlings to collapse under the pressure to perform or to die. In a strange sense, we are almost forced to confront the fact that Thrawn isn't entirely wrong. The New Republic is weak, it is indeed still fractured, and it is following the same footsteps of the Old Republic that did need destroying. Thrawn's mission was to ensure the galaxy would be protected against the threat of the Yuzhong Vong. This was all spurred on by the destruction of his own people, who suffered and died due to their own inability to act. Many cannot accept the moral corners that Thrawn cuts in the name of ultimate peace, and we cannot wait to see if this is the sort of material that is ever expanding upon in the show, and Thrawn's return during Ahsoka. In the finale of Star Wars Rebels, Thrawn and Ezra disappeared into hyperspace, having been shot off into oblivion by the way of the Purgle. For many years, we had all assumed that they had been shot into the Unknown Regions, which is the largely unexplored second half of the main galaxy that we know. However, in Ahsoka, it has now been revealed to us that they in fact had not been shot into the unknown regions, but rather an entirely separate galaxy altogether. This actually makes a lot of sense, since Thrawn actually grew up in the Unknown Regions and would have been able to make his way back quite simply. In Legends, Thrawn made his grand return in the main galaxy from the Unknown Regions of Space and not a new galaxy, and there he proceeded to become the largest threat to the New Republic, the greatest threat since Sidious and Vader themselves, with some deeming Thrawn even superior to the might of Palpatine's empire. But what Thrawn was actually up to in the Unknown Regions in Legends is far more terrifying than many many ever thought, which was establishing a brand new empire of his own. Thrawn's empire was actually better than the original, so much better in fact that the Jedi turned a blind eye to it and allowed it to continue to exist. So exactly how was this possible? Why were the Jedi allowing Thrawn to grow in power in the Unknown Regions? And could this have major consequences in Star Wars canon, giving us a greater idea of the empire of Grand Admiral Thrawn? And now as we open the holocron, we introduce you to the Empire of the Hand, 
and discuss how it was basically a perfected empire. This is especially important considering what's being set up in the Ahsoka series and Thrawn's Grand Return. Star Wars canon has recently been setting up a track record on borrowing largely from Legends, which means Legends content is still very much a viable source and we can use it as a rubric as of now. At the moment, it is still unclear whether the Imperial remnants that Thrawn is bringing together will result in the First Order or the Empire of the Hand. But what we can see is that Thrawn is intending to bring the Empire back at least in some shape or form. By using the Imperial intelligence laced all throughout the New Republic, Thrawn is able to analyze the defenses of his enemies and use their resources against them while he builds up his own empire to challenge and overtake the galaxy. So while Thrawn is building his new empire, we can get a vision of what that looks like by analyzing the Empire of the Hand in Legends. This all started out as a simple mapping expedition from the Unknown Regions organized directly by Palpatine. To Palpatine, too long had the mysterious unknown regions lied unexplored and looming dangerously off in the distance. Palpatine wanted to have a clear understanding of what was out there what sort of threats and powers that it offered. The Emperor would send Thrawn as well as his fleet into unknown space so that he could actually create maps of star charts for Palpatine to later follow. Thrawn also though had an order to make connections with the populace and various planets that lied in unknown wild space, trying to gain favor with them so when he explored he would have safe passage, with the grand plan being to eventually induct them into the Empire as well. But of course, like most things in the Empire, the whole mapping effort thing was mostly a facade. In reality, Thrawn was on a secret mission to create a bulwark against the Yuzhong Vong, something that Sidious apparently kept an eye on. Thrawn was given full leeway to set up this shadow empire in any way that suited the efforts in the unknown regions. Essentially, Thrawn was the emperor of wild space. Thus, Thrawn created what is known as the Empire of the Hand, which in actuality was a simple network of planets and systems that formed a sort of wall in the unknown regions. This would serve as the front line of defense and watchmen against the Yuzhong Vong, but protection against the Vong was only part of what the Empire of the Hand was capable of. The Empire of the Hand also served as a unit of protection from all threats to the innocence of the unknown regions. It was a valiant cause. Like we said, the Hand was basically if the Empire was done correctly, as Thrawn had full control over it and thus created it in his own image of how he thought the Empire should be run. Rather than seek to conquer planets and systems through brute force and fear, he worked to form alliances with the native governments within unknown space and allowed them to self-govern under the protection that the Hand offered. In exchange, these planets would allow the Hand to set up bases and fortifications of their turf so that they could expand the range and influence of Thrawn's new empire. With this in place, fringe groups of marauders, raiders, and pirates that normally threatened these worlds of the unknown space were put in their places, as the Hand now had staked its claim in a significant portion of space. But even so, Thrawn would implement many new rules into his empire that changed it from the original version that Sidious created. Thrawn made sure the Hand treated enemies with respect, gathered much intelligence before engaging any threat, and emphasized tactical reasoning, prioritizing the safety of their soldiers, the latter being something that the regular Empire never did, and was one of Thrawn's major critiques of Vader and Sidious. Thrawn created great loyalty among the Empire of the Hand, they respected, and some of them loved the Grand Admiral. To Thrawn, the people serving under him weren't just faceless helmets, they were hardworking individuals laying down their life on the line to make the galaxy a better place. Thrawn would implement Chiss' ideology of his homeland into the way of the Hand. Eventually this culminated in a strong alliance between the Chiss Ascendancy and the Empire of the Hand, Thrawn's people welcoming him back yet again. But there was still more to correct in the Empire that Thrawn saw. The Empire of the Hand allowed non-human species within their ranks and didn't rule by fear. Thrawn completely did away with the Tarkin Doctrine and corrected the major wrong that Sidious had on the alien species of the galaxy. The Emperor of Palpatine had mistreated and cast aside all species that were not human, species that then turned to the Rebellion for aid. But for Thrawn's empire, this was no longer an issue. Based off of all these changes, the Unknown Regents welcomed their new overlords in a new era of prosperity and peace. This made the Empire of the Hand far stronger, as these systems were far more willing to give more in order to serve Thrawn. In the end, this completely cut out all the corruption, evil, and megalomania that existed in Sidious's and Vader's empire. 
This is also why Thrawn never had a need for super weapons. Not only was he himself too tactically intelligent to need them, but he also saw them as major weaknesses since they were just large, expensive targets for the enemy. The only major conflict that would arise within the Empire of the Hand was their wars with the Sea Ruvi. Eventually though, Thrawn would conquer this threat. However, when he returned to the main galaxy, he was met with a terrifying realization. Palpatine's empire had completely collapsed. The Jedi had returned, and not only was Palpatine dead, but Vader as well. Thrawn had returned to known space to reveal to Palpatine all that he had learned, and reveal just how powerful the Hand had become. And it was here that he learned of the Battle of Endor that the fact that the Empire as he knew it was completely in shambles. The new rulers of the galaxy was the same rebellion thought to have no chance, and they established a brand new republic. Disgusted and angered by this, Thrawn launched his most devastating and successful campaign yet, his claim to fame in Legends continuity. In fact, Thrawn had even backed the New Republic so far that he was able to lay siege to Coruscant itself, before he was eventually betrayed and killed by one of his own men. Nonetheless though, it was not the might of the New Republic that conquered Thrawn. Thrawn was on the eve of utter victory. Following Thrawn's death, Luke and the Jedi investigated Thrawn's Imperial remnants to be sure that they knew how much of the Empire still remained, thus leading them directly into the Empire of the Hand. But here, something shocking happened. The Jedi realized how different Thrawn's Empire was from the original one, and how much it had actually helped the Unknown Regents. Though there was a secret cloning program where Thrawn was attempting to be reborn through a clone of himself, Luke made sure that the Hand destroyed the clone, and in return, he kept their existence a secret from the New Republic, creating a treaty between the Jedi and the Empire of the Hand. With this agreement in place, the Hand was allowed to continue thriving even after Thrawn's death, as they obeyed the statutes that were put in place. The Hand would eventually resurface to aid the New Republic and the galaxy, helping them during the war with the Yuzhong Vong. Following this, the Empire of the Hand would mysteriously vanish, having completed the purpose for which it was created. Though records indicate that the Hand continued to exist in secrecy far after the destruction of the Vong. In conclusion, the Empire of the Hand was everything the Galactic Empire wasn't and should have been. This also means though, that if Thrawn had conquered the New Republic, his empire would have spanned the entire galaxy the Unknown Regions included, making it superior to Sidious's empire. And in truth, it wouldn't have been all that bad for the average galactic citizen. It's almost ironic that Thrawn's success would have actually been the preferable outcome if we're taking the view of the galaxy at large. But that will bring up an interesting equation if this is the rubric that canon follows for Thrawn's resurgent empire. In canon, it is clear that the New Republic is incompetent. Thrawn himself would even point out that the New Republic was inept because they had been born from a rebellion. All they knew how to do was to rebel against the established institution and they now would have to learn what actually running that institution was like, realizing it was completely different. In fact, throughout all of this campaign, Thrawn refused to dignify the New Republic by calling them that, and instead referred to them as the Rebellion. Adding on to this, Thrawn didn't even allow anyone serving under him to call them the New Republic either. As if they did, Thrawn would show them an uncharacteristic amount of anger and frustration. I will be personally extremely interested to see what happens when they feature Thrawn, and exactly if this counters this rubric from Legends. Excited to see if in Thrawn's mind if the Rebellion actually won, or if this is simply the next stage of the war. Interesting to see if this version of Thrawn actually poses a better version of the Empire a fact that Thrawn might exploit and use against the New Republic. The ending of The Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 5 gave us quite a unique stir once we found out that Moff Gideon had escaped the New Republic's custody. As the Rangers encountered the remains of the Lambda-class shuttle floating in space, they found and deduced that it had been Moff Gideon's transport which had been attacked. The only piece of evidence that points to the culprit of this attack was a shard of Beskar sticking into the interior hole. Greetings, curious acolytes and Mandalorian mercenaries of the galaxy, and welcome back to the archives. I think we can all agree that it's quite obvious that Gideon's escape by the Mandalorians may have been framed. We have seen that Gideon has access to Beskar, which he clearly used to set the Mandalorians up in order to get them in trouble with the New Republic. But if this is the case, then who exactly freed Moff Gideon, and why? This is of course the big mystery of the episode, and the one that it left us on. 
But today, my friends, we have a theory ready to go. Certain circumstantial evidence might point to Moff Gideon's escape being orchestrated and executed by one Grand Admiral Thrawn. So now, it's time to open up another holocron, and one that could potentially peer into the near future of the Star Wars timeline. So, let us begin. It only makes sense that Moff Gideon would want to frame the Mandalorians, since they got in his way and cost him his victory with Grogu. The Mandalorians, Din Djarin specifically, have repeatedly proven themselves to be an impediment to the plans of the surviving remnants of the Great Empire. So the best way to slow them down without costing further Imperial resources would to be to pit them against the New Republic. And unfortunately, we've been shown that the New Republic isn't the most perceptive governing system, largely due to the fact that they have transitioned from being a small rebellion into being the presiding rulers of the known galaxy. The problem is that even though the New Republic has been instated for nearly a decade by this point in time, they are barely keeping themselves together and can't even keep the mid-rim worlds in balance, much less worry about the ever-growing threat of the Imperial Remnant. A shocking revelation that we learned in this episode, that the Empire is now growing yet again, presumably the first time since Sidious and Vader's defeat, and likely growing under Grand Admiral Thrawn. The Grand Admiral is an absolute genius tactician and will most certainly be taking advantage of the New Republic's lack of insight, setting up this perfect ruse to get them to focus on the Mandalorians rather than the Empire which is continuing to gain power from the unknown regions. Moff Gideon was able to cause a significant amount of trouble just by himself with his limited resources. Once Thrawn re-emerges into the picture, the Empire will come back in full swing just as they did in Legends Continuity. We have noticed a few ghost patterns here and there that suggest that the canon EU may be very closely following Legends continuity and the events of the EU, at least for the Thrawn saga. The way things are looking, it seems that Grand Admiral Thrawn will be back at full power and will likely bring the New Republic to its knees as he did in Legends. But how would he do this exactly? And what evidence do we have to Thrawn's plan and how it will unfold? And why is Moff Gideon so important to it? There are two distinct pieces of information that clue us into Thrawn's grand plan. The first being all the not-so-subtle references and setups concerning the cloning of Force Sensitives. The entire reason that Grogu had been captured in the first place was revealed to us in Season 2 of The Mandalorian, when Din Djarin, Cara Dune, Grief Karga, and Mithril investigated and destroyed the Imperial Research Outpost on Navarro. Inside this outpost, they found an incriminating lab with several Bacta tanks full of various specimens, a hollow message to Moff Gideon by Dr. Pershing. Here, he explains that he has been trying to splice the DNA of subjects with midichlorians, likely trying to make artificial force sensitives. This of course failed, as the bodies of the non-force sensitives rejected the midichlorians or became overwhelmed and died. We also know this to be the case when looking at the research notes of none other than Darth Plagueis, who experimented in very similar ways with very similar results during his depraved time as a Sith. But moving on, we later see in Season 3, Dr. Pershing explaining to the New Republic the details of his experimental theory, which consisted of the idea of safely splicing the DNA of two different specimens in order to achieve a clone with the advantages of both specimens, clearly in an attempt to create a Force-sensitive clone. This specific experiment seems to be one of the end goals for this Imperial Remnant, and it directly echoes the plan that Thrawn had in Legends Continuity. Having used the DNA of Luke Skywalker, Grand Admiral Thrawn had begun the creation of an entirely new clone army, this time with the genes of Force Sensitivity. His ultimate goal was to raise an army of Force Sensitives that were completely subservient to his new empire. The reason being, Thrawn had become somewhat fascinated with Skywalker and the entire idea of Force Sensitivity after Luke killed Palpatine, and as far as he knew, Vader as well. Amazed by this, he wanted to raise up an elite Force-sensitive army of his own, believing it to be the best possible way to get revenge on the New Republic and topple them for good. We can see this plan being carried out right before our eyes in canon as we speak, and it's very likely that Ahsoka might have figured this out either by deduction or had it revealed to her in a vision through the Force. Either way, Ahsoka is going after Grand Admiral Thrawn specifically, and it may not just be to rescue Ezra. This near brings us to our next piece of evidence, that being the Dark Jedi, Joris Sabayoth. 
Many are quite well aware of the rumor that came about from the Ahsoka series, and that we will feature prominently a Dark Jedi, likely the antagonist for a small while. Many, including our own researchers here at the Archives, are convinced that this Dark Jedi may in fact be the insane Jedi Master, Joris Sabayoth. For those who don't know, this insane Jedi originally comes from Legends, and he was one of the main catalysts for Thrawn's biggest successes. Having struck a bargain with this Dark Jedi, Thrawn had promised to deliver Luke Skywalker and his children to the Master, in exchange for his abilities in battle meditation. You see, Joris Sabayoth desired to create his own Jedi Order in his image, likely with the use of the Dark Side and needed a Padawan along with some impressionable children in order to do so. Luke Skywalker and the offspring of Leia Organa Solo were the perfect candidates for this new Dark Order. Therefore, Thrawn tried repeatedly to capture the Skywalker family and deliver them to Sabayoth. However, with little success most of the time, but meanwhile, Thrawn was using the Dark Jedi Master in his fleet, as Sabaoth could use battle meditation, which was instrumental in many of Thrawn's victories. However, Joris Sabaoth soon proved himself to be quite the liability, as he was unpredictable, selfish, and erratic. Being completely insane, he believed that he was the most important person on Thrawn's ship due to his status as a Jedi Master, and only obeyed Thrawn's orders because he wanted Luke Skywalker. However, when Thrawn was having difficulties delivering on his end of the bargain, Joris Sabayoth became a nuisance, and soon an outright danger out of himself when he began to make threats to the Grand Admiral, and even followed through with them on some occasions. On one occasion, force choking Thrawn, doing so in a very heated hologram conversation. This caused Thrawn to start believing that this was more trouble than he was worth, and he was soon looking forward to ridding himself of the crazed Dark Jedi. We may see these things come to play very, very soon, because of course the core reason that Joris Sabayoth was a clone. As he knew him, Joris Sabayoth was a clone of a Jedi Master that died during the Clone Wars, and it was because of this cloning process that he had been driven insane. And we believe we are beginning to see the very implementation of this plan of a Dark Jedi clone being introduced to Star Wars canon. And we believe that Thrawn thinks that Moff Gideon has the information on how to perfect a Force-sensitive clone and build a Force-sensitive army. Therefore, why he was deemed extremely important and freed, likely to begin joining the ranks of the Grand Admiral. But why is it that throughout all the vast lore, there is only one specific entity that Thrawn ever appears to have any fear for? In a galaxy populated with extremely deadly enemies and allies alike in the forms of Sidious, Vader, and the Empire, it is only the Bendu, the one in the middle, that truly shakes Thrawn to his very core. In Season 3 of Star Wars Rebels, we can see this as Thrawn and the Bendu meet for the first and supposedly final time. After Thrawn believes that he has defeated the Bendu and and approaches it, he inquires about what the Bendu is and what it commands, believing initially to what the Bendu did with the Force Storm to be simply a Jedi trick. Thrawn understood this, or at least he thought he did. When Thrawn approaches the Bendu and inquires exactly what it is, the Bendu offers him no explanation. The Bendu only predicts Thrawn's defeat at the hand of the Ghost crew, giving him no explanation of who or what it is. In a rare moment of anger for Grand Admiral Thrawn, Thrawn shoots the Bendu in the head, but to his utter shock and surprise, the creature disappears, laughing at him through the Force. The final fateful words of the creature, echoing in Thrawn's mind, you cannot see, but I can see. I can see your defeat, like many arms surrounding you in a cold embrace. This is the prophecy concerning Thrawn's defeat above Lothal, when Jedi Knight Ezra Bridger sacrificed himself to bring the Purgle to him and then jump Thrawn and Ezra as a result into another galaxy entirely, which of course is the big plotline for the Ahsoka series. But what about the relationship between Thrawn and the Bendu is so unique, and why out of everything in the galaxy, Thrawn holds an especial amount of fear for this creature. To answer this, we have to look at the character of Grand Admiral Thrawn and the things that he values most. Thrawn values uniformity and order. He believes in fairness. And above everything else, Thrawn believes in his own intelligence. But what is intelligence exactly, but the ability to understand? Thrawn's greatest weapon is his ability to understand an enemy to analyze their art and understand what they will do because of it. Analyze his enemies, learn them, and adapt to them. 
This is Thrawn's greatest strength. It is the thing that has won him countless victories, and his intelligence and understanding of concepts is also what has protected him for so long. Thrawn's ability to understand these concepts has kept him and his people safe for a very long time. He analyzed the Republic when he teamed up with Anakin Skywalker, seeing the tumultuous nature of the galaxy at large, deciding at the time not to join with the Republic because it was unorganized and a civil war had broken out. Later, though, he ultimately decided to join the Empire and Palpatine, the greatest evil in the galaxy, for the simple reason because he understood Palpatine and what he wanted. He understood just how powerful Sidious was, but he also knew that if he could understand Sidious's goals, he could keep himself and his people safe. He understood that above all else, he wanted power, a concept that Thrawn could comprehend and get behind. And because of that, he granted the Emperor more power and worked diligently by his side. He then looked at Lord Vader. Lord Vader wanted vengeance. Above anything else, Lord Vader was motivated by results and controlling the ability to utterly destroy any of those that came against him, especially the Jedi or those who stood against the Empire. Vader was motivated by anger. Sidious was motivated by power. The rebels that Thrawn fought against were motivated by freedom and justice. Thrawn saw that the Imperials that he surrounded surrounded himself with were motivated by greed. To take things even further, Thrawn even understood the Jedi Order. He knew at once that they were motivated by peace, but now that they too were motivated by rebellion and an effort to restore that peace that they once held so dearly. Thrawn is constantly surrounded by things that he can understand, and because he can comprehend them, he can control them and counteract against it. He spends weeks analyzing his enemies for this simple fact. So then, the reason why Thrawn would hold such fear for the Bendu now begins to come to light. The Bendu represents a part of the Star Wars mythos that Thrawn is unable to, and at the end, unwilling to understand completely. In my opinion, Thrawn's true defeat is at the hands of the Bendu, but it is not a defeat of the physical world. It is a defeat of Thrawn's very mind, the location where he is the strongest. As we stated, when the Bendu transforms into a Force Storm and attacks Thrawn and the Imperials, he views this as a Jedi trick, something that he can understand. He understands that they are motivated to defeat him, knowing their ultimate goal. But once the Bendu is shot down and Thrawn and his forces approach him, he understands that he does not completely grasp the situation. In a completely genuine moment, Thrawn decides to ask the Bendu who he is. As in a rare moment, Thrawn realizes he knows nothing of the creature that is laid before him. All that he truly knows is that the Bendu, when destroying the Imperials, stated that it was the light and the dark, the Bendu. The reason in this moment the Bendu's Force Storm was able to defeat Thrawn was because Thrawn was confronted with something completely unforeseen. He had no plans in place at all to counteract the Bendu, and he had no way to anticipate it would have arrived and aided the Rebels' crew. The greatest weakness to Thrawn is the factor that he cannot anticipate nor control. His greatest fear is being confronted with the situation, or in this case, an entity that he knows nothing about. But it goes far deeper than even this. When Thrawn approaches the Bendu, he asks almost reverently, what manner of creature are you? Genuinely curious about what the Bendu is, eager to learn anything about this unforeseen threat. The Bendu, though, simply responds with, one beyond your power to destroy. Thrawn almost scoffs as he points his blaster directly at the Bendu. The Bendu again tells Thrawn that he cannot see, but that he can. Thrawn is afraid. The Force is something that is impossible to calculate. It is impossible to predict. And for Thrawn, it is impossible to understand in this moment, especially where the Bendu lies. Unlike the Jedi and the Sith, who use the Force for their own goals, the Bendu is in the middle. It uses the Force, and is the Force, because that is what it is. And when the Bendu predicts Thrawn's defeat, he is overcome with an extremely rare moment of rage. Thrawn realizes that the Bendu is absolutely correct, he is beyond the power that Thrawn can comprehend, at least in this moment. And Thrawn as a result lets his ego and his rage take over, aiming his blaster at the Bendu and firing, killing the creature. Or so Thrawn thought. In the greatest insult that Thrawn has ever experienced, he now understands that he does not even grasp the concept of life and death, victory or defeat. The Bendu disappears, laughs, joins the Force as it always belonged. Nothing has changed for the Bendu. It is still there. 
it will always be there. This very thought shakes Thrawn to his very core. The creature was right. It is beyond his power to destroy. It is beyond his own power to even comprehend and predict. What's important to understand about this moment is when the Bendu disappears, it is still very much alive and does not disappear into the Force within death. It does not join with the Force in a manner of Obi-Wan Kenobi or others who pass on through the Force. This is not the first time that the Bendu has vanished into thin air. What the Bendu said was right. Thrawn does not command the power necessary to destroy it. And the lesson for all of this, the moment that Thrawn is the most afraid, the creature that strikes utter terror into the Grand Admiral, is a simple fact. For all of Thrawn's genius, for all the knowledge that he commands, he can never truly comprehend the Force, especially as the Bendu comprehends. Thrawn struggles to comprehend, predict, define, or understand the Force. It is something that genuinely chills him to his core. Many other high-ranking officers would have simply mocked the Bendu or laughed it off as superstition, but Thrawn is intelligent enough to know better. He knows what the Bendu has told him about his prophecy is true, and that is what truly frightens him. But I will be interested to see Thrawn's progression in the Ahsoka series, if this moment truly defined him as a character as I believe that it did, and if the Bendu and his impact has anything yet to reveal to us in the lore. As always my friends and acolytes, thank you for visiting the archives, and as always, may the Force be with you.